So let's take a look at the actual solutions and where they came from for the review. Uh, question one says here, the Gallup poll interviews 1,600 people. Of these, 18% say they jog regularly. The news report adds, the poll had a margin of error of plus or minus three percentage points at a 95% confidence level. Based on this, you can safely conclude that for this one here, the correct answer was um, actually letter A. And the reasoning behind it is because of the definition of confidence level. Uh, you really want to know the difference between confidence level and confidence interval. Now, before we talk about why A is correct, let's talk about why the other four are not correct. The issue with letter B, it says the percent of the population who jog is certain to be between this number. That is going to knock it off right there as having the word certain. For letter C, here it says 95% of the population jog between 15 and 21% of the time. The issue here is the population. Confidence intervals and confidence levels, when we look at those, are related just to samples, so that cannot be the case. For letter D, we can be 95% confident that the sample proportion is captured by the confidence interval. Uh, this is actually fairly close to being a correct answer, with exception to this. They are talking about the sample proportion. Well, the thing we know about the sample proportion um, is that it will be captured in the confidence interval because that's how the confidence interval was created. So truly, what this uh, should have said is that we are 100% confident that the sample proportion is captured by that interval. Uh, because it wasn't, this one is wrong. In for letter E, if Gallup took many samples, 95% of them would find that 18% of the people in the sample jog. Now, unfortunately, this problem implies, when it talks about took many, many samples, this right here is about the construction of confidence intervals, which is good. But it would show that 95% of them would have the true population answer in it, not the actual original samples answer in there. So therefore, that one is wrong. Thus, when you read a letter A, it's going to be 95% of the Gallup poll samples like this one give answers within plus or minus 3% of the true population value. And this talks about various samples. Question two, the weight in pounds of three adult males are 160, 215, and 195. The standard error of the mean of these weights is what? What you need to do for this problem is you can go to your calculator and do a list one and do a one variable stat. When you do that, by the way, you're going to get X bar, or the mean, is 190. S of X is the sample standard deviation, and that's 27.8. Now be careful, 27.8 is there, but this is the standard deviation of the sample. What they want in this case is they are asking for the standard error of the mean. Remember when we look at the confidence interval for the means, it's going to be X bar plus or minus the critical value for T, and then S of X over the square root of N. This value right here that I just highlighted, this is called the standard error. So to compute the standard error, you're just going to put this in here. Our sample size in this case is 3. When you simplify that, you will get the exact answer, which is letter D. Question 3. In preparing to construct a one-sample T interval for the population mean, suppose we are not sure if the population is normal. In which of the following circumstances would we not be safe constructing the interval on a simple random sample of size 24 from the population. Now in this problem we are looking for the T interval of the population mean. So because we're doing means we can use the central limit theorem which would say if n is greater than or equal to 30 um, we know that we can say that the sampling distribution is approximately normal. However, we do not meet the central limit theorem because we have a sample size of 24. Therefore, your only requirement in this case is you must graph this out. When you graph it out, you have to look for outliers and skewness. Now, if the sample size is in between 15 and 30, in this case is where we are, what we're looking for here is that there is little skewness and no extreme outliers. So knowing those conditions, if we take a look at it, we can see that letter C, we did look at the stem plot. By the way, it doesn't matter if we choose to look at the stem plot or a histogram. Those are both fine ways to graph it. Um, it does have a large outlier. Because of that, it is going to break our extreme outlier condition. Um, and C would be the appropriate answer for this case. 
Uh, let's talk about A. A is a great way to graph it, and it's roughly bell-shaped. So we would see little skewness, so that's not a problem. Um, part B says we have little skewness. We used a histogram. That's great, so we meet that one. Uh, D and E in this case are not elements that we actually look at when we're checking for approximately normal or the shape. Number four, many television viewers express doubts about the validity of certain commercials. In an attempt to answer their critics, Timex Group USA wishes to estimate the proportion of consumers who believe what is shown in the Timex television commercials. Let P represent the true proportion of consumers who believe what is shown in the Timex uh, television commercial. What is the smallest number of consumers that Timex can survey to guarantee a margin of error of 0 0.05 or less at a 99% confidence level? Now, we are dealing with proportions, so what I'm going to do is actually just jot down um, our standard error that we would use uh, for the proportions. And remember, that comes from, if we were looking at a confidence interval for proportions, would be p hat plus or minus z critical value of our standard error in this case, which was p hat times 1 minus p hat, and that's going to be divided by n. Now what we need to address is they want our margin of error, which remember the standard error in this case is just going to be uh, the standard deviation component altogether is the margin of error. It needs to be less than 0.05. So we can set up a, an equation for that. Now the first thing we do have to actually do is we need to find our critical value to be 99% confident. So remember the curve itself, um, to be 99% confident, we are talking this is 99%, but we want for the confidence level, uh, the critical value at that point, here is the Z star. So we actually have to look at 0.995 of the curve. So if you do an inverse norm of 0.995, of 0 and 1, it will actually kick back the critical value for us in this case, which is going to be 2.58. So now we can set up our formula. And we would just put a 2.58. Uh, and then when we look at the amount for the standard error, if they don't talk about the p hat and the problem, be conservative and assume p hat is 0.5 is what you should do for any types of these problems. So therefore, let's put 0.5. Uh, 1 minus p hat would be 1 minus the 0.5. And here our sample size is what we are trying to figure out. So that would be n. And this, we want it to be less than or equal to 0 0.05, which is this margin of error they're looking for. Now the best way to solve this, the first thing I'm going to actually do is go ahead and move, divide by 2.58. Um, so let me just write that. Um, and then I'm going to simplify, and let's do the uh, 0.5 times really the 0.5 on here, um, which obviously is going to give us the 0.25 over n. I'm then going to take the square of both sides to get rid of that square root. And then if we do uh, simplify the side, we're going to end up having here, um, bear with me, uh, 0.25n. Uh, this here is going to equal, if I do the decimal, um, let's actually keep it as, uh, we'll just do 0 .00, 0, uh, 0.00037558. Is that answer? Uh, then what I can go ahead and do, um, remember cross multiplication, this n can comes out, this number can go down. So let's take the 0.25 and actually divide by the answer from the right hand side and this is going to get us a sample size of about 665. So knowing in this case that the answer is 665, we need to find uh, the smallest number of consumers. Unfortunately, 650 is not going to meet the requirement, so the really best answer in this case is going to be 700. Number five, you want to compute a 90% confidence level for the mean of a population with an unknown population standard deviation. The sample size is 30. The value of T star uh, you would use in this interval is what? So let's go ahead and keep in mind we want to compute the 90% confidence interval. So that would mean we want 90% of this curve right here. 
Um, to get the t-critical value, it's right here. But remember, when we go and get probabilities, it's going to be from that point all the way to the tail. So the t tail here, these two tails are going to be 10%, so this is an additional 5%. So we need 95% of the curve. So let's go ahead and do an inverse t. I want 0.95. Now, for t-critical values or for the means, what we put in here is the degrees of freedom. Remember, deg degrees of freedom is sample size minus 1, so you put in 29. When you do that, you will get letter B. Number 6, a radio talk show host with a large audience is, is interested in the proportion of adults in his listening area who think the drinking age should be lowered to 18. To find this out, he poses the following question to his listeners. Do you think that the drinking age should be reduced to 18 in light of the fact that 18-year-olds are eligible for military service? He asks listeners to phone in and vote yes if they agree the drinking age should be lowered and no if not. Of the 100 people who phoned, 70 answered yes. Uh, which of the following conditions for inference about a proportion using a confidence interval are violated? So remember the three conditions we do need to check are going to be randomness, independence, and then if it's approximately normal are the three conditions for that. Now let's work backwards. For normal C, uh, for proportions, we have to make sure that n times p hat and n times 1 minus p hat are both greater than or equal to 10 in this case. His sample size uh, was 100. Uh, the proportion that answered yes was 70, so this we're going to have 70 and 30, so normal C would be fine in this one. So what we know is 2 is not violated. Um, so let's take that as a strategy, though. If we know 2 is not violated, we know it can't be this one. It can't be this one because it has 2, and it can't be that because it has 2. So it's either A or C is our issue. Uh, let's talk about independence in this case. For independence, remember the population is greater than or equal to 10 times the sample size. His sample was 100, so is the population, can we assume there's at least 1,000 listeners? Sure, that's not going to be a problem. Um, so in this case, letter 3 actually does make it. It's not an issue, so we know by default the answer is A. Uh, the reason is, just as we know here, randomness is not met. Um, he violates really the Chapter 4 rules on doing a, a good sample. Um, this is a voluntary sample of just his listeners. Um, it is not done randomly, so randomness is not met. Number 7, a 90% confidence interval for the mean mu of a population is computed from a random sample. It is found to be 9 plus or minus 3. Which of the following could be a 95% confidence interval for the same data? So what we know here is that we're dealing with mu or the means. So um, I don't know anything about the sample size. So I'm not going to use the t critical value. I'm going to use the z critical value, which would say it's x bar plus or minus z critical value of the square root of sigma over n, which is our standard error. Uh, keeping in mind, this is our margin of error, which they actually said was 3. I know it's 95% confident, so what I can do is I can go ahead and compute the z critical value for 90% confidence. Again, if we're doing 90%, we want 90% of the curve, but we need it from all the way down here, so we need 95. If you do an inverse norm of 95, a 0.95 and 0 and 1, you are actually going to get the critical value of 1.645. So let's go ahead and put z is 1.645. We don't currently know the margin of, or the standard error, I'm sorry, but I know the margin of error equals 3. Well, I can easily solve for this standard error. All I need to do is take 3 and divide 3 by 1.645. If I do that, what it's going to give me is that um, our standard error right here is going to equal 1.8. Two, three. Now, they want us to construct a 95% confidence interval. Fine, to do 95%, all we need here is our new z-score, our critical value, and we know the standard error is 1.823. So let's compute a new inverse norm. In this case, our inverse norm, for 95% of the curve, we really want 0 0.975, 0 and 1. Uh, that critical value is going to give us a 1.96. 
Let's take that times our current standard error of 1.823, which would get us approximately 3.57 or 3.6. So based on these results, which could be uh, the answer, letter D would be a reasonable option to figure out what the confidence interval would be. Do be cautious, though, with choice E. You might think it wouldn't work because um, if you were to choose the T critical value, remember to find T critical value, you need to compute degrees of freedom in which you do need the sample size. So you can't figure out T critical value on this one, but we can do the Z critical value uh, using the means. Number eight, suppose we want a 90% confidence interval for an average amount spent on books by freshmen in their first year at a major university. The interval is to have a margin of error of $2. Based on last year's book sales, we estimate the standard deviation of the amount spent will be close to $30. The number of observations required is closest to what? So basically, again, here's a question about sample size. Um, what we do know is we need to find the sample size. So again, using the T critical value won't help us, but we can do Z critical value. This is dealing with um, the amount spent on books, which is the means. Uh, so what we're going to look at in this case is we want the Z critical value, and it's going to be sigma over the square root of N. This is the margin of error for that one. Let's just fill in the information. Uh, we know that the Z critical value, they want us to be 90% confident. So we're going to use inverse norm at 95%. That is going to give us a 1.645 for our value. So let's do 1.645 for the critical value. We already know that the standard error is actually going to be 30 in this case. So let me adjust this. I'd written two. Um, divided by the square root of n. Uh, our margin of error needs to be less than or equal to this value, so that would be 2. Um, if we do the math again here to solve this, um, what you're going to ultimately end up doing is, again, let's divide by the 1.645. So we're going to have 30 divided by the square root of n is less than or equal to 2 divided by 1.645. Um, I'm going to go ahead uh, right now and just actually do a little bit of cross multiplication. I'm going to bring that up, I'm going to bring that one down, and I'm going to bring the square root of n over. That would give us 30 times 1.645. That whole thing divided by 2 is equal to the square root of n. Clearly, to get n by itself, let's go ahead and square both sides. Uh, when you do this, you're going to get an answer of, I got, I think, approximately 608. 0.8. Uh, really 0.9, which is going to be really important. So based on that, uh, we want to know, I think it is how low, small the sample size is going to be in this case. 608 is not going to be enough because I need to have that 0.9. So the answer here is going to be 609. A telephone poll of an SRS of 1,234 adults found that 62% are generally satisfied with their lives. The announced margin of error for the poll was 3%. Does this margin of error account for the fact that some adults do not have telephones? Now, in relation to proportions, if they were going to do a confidence interval, uh, this is the formula they would use. The margin of error is right here the entire thing. Um, the margin of error takes into consideration the standard error or really our standard deviation. Uh, here's what you just need to know about that. Standard deviation is only going to give us the information about variability. So the key to this problem is includes the sample variability information because it includes the standard error. Um, so the issue here, does the margin of error account for the fact that some adults don't have telephones? No, it doesn't. The margin of error only accounts for variability in our data. Um, just know that when we talk about, look at these other responses, non-response and under coverage, all of these comments here in C and D, this is related to Chapter 4 and just a bad design. Um, taking an SRS eliminates bias from that. Well, yeah, setting up a good sample is having an SRS again from Chapter 4, and the point is we're not going to have bias, hopefully, in our questioning and all of that. Um, in Part A, the margin of error includes all sources of error in the poll. No, absolutely not. Margin of error is just, again, that mathematical variability only. If you do a crappy job and you design this thing, poorly, that's going to be error, and that's only accounted for by human construction of how the uh, investigation or the study was set up.
Number 10, a Census Bureau report on the income of Americans say that 90% confidence the median income for U.S. households in a recent year was $75,500 with a margin of error of $742 either plus or minus. What does that mean? Now, whenever you see a question like this, here's what I'm going to tell you. You want to look for either them defining confidence level or confidence interval. Even though they're talking about the confidence interval construction here, they may have defined in one of these five choices correctly the confidence level. It's very possible. So look for one of those to be correct. Um, if we take a look at it, uh, letter A, 90% of all households have incomes. This is not true. This is talking about the population. It clearly can't be that option. B, we can be sure that the median income of all households for this country lies within this. This is the median of all the households. Again, they're kind of talking about the population's guaranteed. Clearly not going to be that one either. For C, 90% uh, of the households in the sample interviewed by the Census Bureau had incomes in the range of this number. This isn't about how many households it, it happened to. This 90% means we are 95% or 90% confident the true population answer will be within this range, not about the sample. Um, we're 100% confident the sample's answers are in that range, so be cautious on that one. It's not C. Let's look at E. 90% of all possible samples of this size would result in the same median that falls within this range. Again, it's not this. This is the range of one particular sample. What are the odds we're going to get another sample like that? Probably very unlikely. Um, so this is just not the definition of it. Uh, what you're going to see here is D is the correct answer in what they said. This is another way of talking about the confidence level. Um, remember, confidence level says if we were to take many, many samples at a 90% confidence, we would expect 90% of those intervals to actually include the true population answer, which is what letter D is referring to. For the free response now, uh, the U.S. Forest Service is considering additional restrictions on the number of vehicles allowed to enter Yellowstone National Park. To assess public reaction, the service asks a random sample of 150 visitors if they favor the proposal. Uh, 89 say yes, which means uh, the other amount do not. Here they want us to construct and interpret a 99% confidence interval for the proportion of visitors at Yellowstone who favor. So be careful, they are talking about uh, who favor is this. Now, let's just remember, this is going to be categorical data, which tells us it's a proportion. They want a confidence interval. What I would first do is jot down. We want P hat plus or minus the Z score. Um, this is going to be our standard error is P hat times 1 minus P hat over N. Now, P hat in this case is going to be the probability of success. Our P hat is going to be 89 over 150. And if you simplify that down, you can, you're going to get 0.9 or 0.593. Uh, the critical value, they want a 99% confidence. So you're going to have to actually find um, the inverse norm on this case because we are due, doing um, a z-score of 0.995. Careful, 0 to 1. And that's going to be a 2.58. And then basically, we can just plug everything in. So if we plug in our values for this, what you're going to get, uh, this formula here. And then we're going to go ahead and let's actually write out the final confidence uh, interval then is going to be a 0.490 to 0.696 is our confidence interval. Now be careful, don't stop there. Um, when you conclude this, we do have to talk about what we would say. So you need to say, we are 99% confident the interval from 0 0.490 to 0 0.699 captures the true proportion of all visitors who favor the restriction. Put this in context at the end. Now, there's one thing I missed at the beginning that you need to also show. Remember, state, plan, do, and conclude. State, we're going to construct the confidence interval. Uh, the state portion is really covered in our problem, so we're fine. The plan, I need to check the conditions, and I'm going to go back and do that in just one second. The do, we're seeing right here is our do. The conclude is going to be the verbal uh, statement that I said before, but it's not written here. So let's go down here 
I'm going to go just in this lower part of the screen, is actually check for the randomness, independence, and the normalcy. Uh, so in this case, if we're going to say random, um, it was a random sample. Just say random sample. We're good. Uh, they did state that. We're fine. Uh, but you do have to state that. For independence, was independence met? Remember, we're looking for a population is going to have to be greater than 10 times the sample size. So we can assume that there were at least 1,500 visitors um, at the uh, national park here. Uh, so that one is also met. For normalcy in this case, uh, for approximately normal, I should say, remember we're going to do n times p hat and also do n times 1 minus p hat. We're looking that it's going to be greater than or equal to 10. When you do that, you're going to get 89 for one of them, and you're going to get 66 for the other. You need to show that these numbers are written in this nature and that they are greater than or equal to 10, so normalcy is met. Uh, so make sure in conjunction with the do and the written conclude, we have um, our plan, or checking our conditions and our plan part. Now part B, based on your work in part A, can the U.S. Forest Service conclude that more than half of the visitors to Yellowstone National Park favor the proposal? Justify your answer. Do be careful on this one. It talks about uh, can you conclude that more than half of the visitors favor this. This is our interval for favoring. So if you favor it, more than half is going to be greater than 50 percent. Uh, the issue we have here is in our interval, we actually have a percentage less than the 50 percent of the majority. So this would be no uh, because the 0.49 is a potential proportion. Uh, that could actually show up and that it is not more than half. Number 12, how many people live in South Africa households? To find out, we collected data from an SRS of 48 out of over 70,000 South African students who took part in the Census at School survey project. The mean number of people living in a household was 6.208 and its standard deviation 2.576. Is the normal condition met in this case? Um, so we are talking about the means in here because this is quantitative data. So the normal condition for this is if we use a central limit theorem, n has to be greater than or equal to 30. So if we use that, um, yes, we are actually okay because 48 is greater than or equal to 30. So we could respond, yes, this, uh, by central limit theorem, we are fine. Okay, part B. Maurice claims that 95% confidence interval for the population mean is this right here. Explain why this interval is wrong, then give the correct interval. So here's the deal. The question is this. He, if you look at this, um, what type of interval did he use? Did he use the T interval or the Z interval? 1.96 uh, actually came from a Z star, if you can recognize that. So he assumed Z star. The only time you can use the Z interval is when we know the standard deviation of the population. Never did they tell us the standard deviation of the population. We only know the standard deviation of this particular sample. So he basically constructed the wrong interval. The interval he needed was to do X bar plus or minus T critical value, standard deviation of the sample over the square root of N. We can easily compute this. Um, let's talk about the T star first. So we want to be 95% confident. Again, remember our confidence interval is the range is 95% in here, uh, but we have to go all the way down. So to do that, we're going to have to do 0.975. So let's compute an inverse uh, T of 0.975. Um, if you look at that, they're now going to ask for the degrees of freedom. That's just sample size minus 1, so type in 47. Um, and that's going to kick back 2.012. So let's go ahead. Our sample mean was 6.208 uh, plus or minus our 2.012. Uh, standard deviation, 2.576 over the square root of 48 in this case. Um, when you simplify this down, your final confidence interval is going to be 5.46 uh, and then up to 6.956. Now remember, you're not done with a confidence interval until you put it in context. 
Um, so we're going to say we are 95% confident the true population mean is going to fall within this range uh, for how many Africans live in, in the households on average. Number 13, a milk processor monitors the number of bacteria per milliliter in raw milk received at the factory. A random sample of 10 1 milliliter sp specimens of milk supplied by one producer give the following data. Here we have it. Construct and interpret a 90% confidence interval for the population mean of meal. Now I really like this one because it's a good start to finish of everything that the AP board would expect for you to have as I would expect for you to have on a test. Um, first thing we need to figure out is it proportions or means. They want the mean. So because it's mean, is it a Z interval or is it a T interval? Since we do not know the standard deviation of the population, uh, what we have to use in this case, and you want to state it, is a one sample T interval. And we'll jot that down for the means. Now, so that's basically our state. We can go ahead right into the plan, and for the plan, let's go ahead and check our conditions of random independence and normalcy. So for here, we're going to have, is it random? It's at a random sample, so I'm just going to jot that down, and I'll get full credit for that. For independence, we know that we need to show that the population is uh, greater than or equal to 10 times our sample size, so that's going to be 100. And you could write a statement such as, yes, there's at least 100 or more uh, samples that we could have chosen from. And then for normalcy in this case, we are talking about uh, the means. Um, so central limit theorem is unfortunately not going to work because our sample size is 10. So what we have to do for normalcy, it's very putsy. You're going to have to graph out the data. You can choose what type of graph you want. Um, you could go ahead and you could do a dot plot, you could do a histogram, you could do a box plot, something that's going to show the shape of this. I chose to do a box plot, and what I actually did is I went into my calculator, because uh, we're going to need to do this actually for the do portion anyway. Go into your calculator under list 1, and then I graphed a box plot. Um, here's what I got for that. So we're going to see this box plot here. Now we need to talk about because of the sample size is less than 15. So if n is less than 15, remember uh, the key conditions here is that we want uh, no outliers and no skewness. So you would need to actually talk about that. And what I would say is that there's slight skewness, but not too much. And there's not really um, any obvious outliers in here. So because of that, we could state approximately normal. And we need to have that written down somewhere on the page. Again, don't just put normal. Make sure it says approximate. So our uh, plan portion is done. Now we can go ahead and move on to the do portion. Um, for the do portion, uh, what you want to do is either state the name of the confidence interval that we are going to, to actually perform, which we have actually done right up here. So a one sample t interval. I'm just going to add here for the means. Now, if you had that written down, you would get full credit for any calculator speak um, in terms of uh, showing the work for it. Um, or if you want, you could also write down the actual formula. So Z or X bar plus or minus. Uh, we don't know that standard deviation, so T critical value. And then we're going to do S of X over the square root of N. So either, again, saying, showing it uh, verbally what it means or actually having the formula is the same thing to the AP board. Uh, for the do portion, let's go ahead and actually find uh, the t critical value. So I need inverse t. Uh, we want a 90%. Um, so we're going to have to find 95% of that curve. Degrees of freedom are 9. Uh, when we do that, we get 1.833. Now, unfortunately, they didn't give us the mean or the standard deviation. You are going to have to go back to your data and do a one variable statistic to find that data. Um, when you do it, you're going to get that the X bar ends up being, I believe, uh, 4,950. The S of X, or standard deviation of the sample, was 268.45. Now, if we just plug that into our confidence interval, uh, we can show that work. So let's just write that out, 4950 plus or minus our critical value. 
and then our standard error in this case is the standard deviation, uh, 268.45 over the square root of our sample size of 10. Um, when you simplify this down, you are going to get your final confidence interval. Um, and what our interval is going to look like is going to be uh, 4794.39 all the way to 5105. Now, don't stop there. That is actually the finishing of our do. To do our conclude, I'm just going to say this and not write it. I would say and write, we are 90% confident that the interval between this value and this value will capture the true population mean of the number of bacteria per milliliter in raw milk received at this factory. And you would get full credit for that. Please seek me out if you have any other specific questions on this review, and good luck when you take your test.